Our first request tonight, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 2 and verse 49. And our prayer is that we would always be about our Father's business. And he said unto them, that's Christ, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my Father's business? And you think about the, the implication of that. Um, in order to, Jesus realized, even at this tender age, uh, what he said to others later, says, I'm from above, you're from beneath. He already knew that he was from above. And so he had business to do that wasn't necessarily, it was done in the world, but it wasn't the world's business. It was his father's business that he had to do. Now, there was a time when we were in the year from beneath category. But those days are past. Now, we can, we can say, because we're begotten of the Father through Christ Jesus, that we are from above. We're going to above. We've, we've experienced that new birth, that, that one that uh, has more to do with heaven. And these things not only have caught our attention, but we're presently engaged in it. it. There's a sense in which we are waiting for the culmination of all things. Even at this time, Jesus, he hadn't um, begun his official ministry. He did that whenever he was about 30 years old. But even at this age, he knew that there was business to be done that, that was associated with his father and not just the things that were done in the earth. It was uh, learning carpentry wasn't the sum total of what he was about, even at 12. They, Mary had, for, I'm, when I say forgotten that, I don't mean like it was like totally out of her mind, but she wasn't operating on that principle yet. And we, this, I imagine, jarred her memory and uh, caused her to think a little bit differently because she was a very sensitive sister and because she, as, as it's written of her, she pondered things in her heart. And so I imagine that the words of Christ to them at that time had quite an impact on her. It, it may have been a, a, a help to her. In, in looking differently at Jesus and in, in what he was involved in. But we ourselves were asking that we would always be about our Father's business, which makes us more attached to what we are becoming and what we have been made and what we shall be than our present circumstance and our present appearance. It does not yet appear what we are, but that doesn't mean we don't operate according to the reality of what we are. So in order to be about your father's business, you have to know who your father is, what your father's doing, and then have a heart for it. So who will lead us in that request? Brother Jeremy, Sister Sydney, Sister Laura. All right, thank you. Our next request is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we'll be reading verse 2, I mean, I'm sorry, 12, and praying that we would learn more fully what it means to lay hold on eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. To lay hold of it. To, to take hold of it, to uh, apprehend that for which you've been apprehended, Amen. to um, make your calling and election sure. There are a lot of, a lot of aspects of this that's spoken about in, in um, Scripture. It has to do with our expressed desire and effort to, to grasp and to keep hold of the things that God gives us. If somebody hands you something and you never close your hand, you're a lot more apt to lose it than if you take hold of it. 
and take a firm grip on it. When God has given us something, it's the manner of, of our lives, it, like we don't forget it. That's a way to, to take hold of it. We, we um, operate according to that knowledge uh, instead of being sloppy about it. That's taking hold of it. That's being alert so we don't miss something that God is offering us or giving us. That's laying hold on it. It, it has to do, we know that our, our, our strength is small. We know that we can do nothing except for God will it. But he has willed to give these things to us. And it, it would be, um, I would think it would be an insult to God and it would be a reproach in the eyes of others for God to extend himself to put these things within our reach and then us to not be fervent about taking it, appreciating it, loving it, keeping it. So this is kind of the concept here to, to lay hold on that. Whenever he's given us a lot. So not to despise any of it. Never let any of it. Have you ever seen somebody that they had something in their hand and it was very precious? It, now, it could, it could be a miner with a handful of gold dust. It could be a child with a handful of candy. It could be whatever. But it could be a lot of things. But if you prize that for any reason, you watch how carefully the, the fingers are kept together. The other hand is... Is, is there, if there's wind and it's light, you see it protected and covered. Provision, if your hands aren't big enough, you see other provisions made. You do whatever you can do to keep that and to protect it so that there's no loss. Mm -hmm. Well, this so great salvation, there, there's nothing in this world that we could compare for preciousness or value. But whatever we can do, to keep from losing any of it and to protect it from loss, to, uh, then that's what we do. Whatever strength we have, whatever facilities we have, whatever opportunities we take hold of, it's all designed to take hold and to hold fast Amen. and to lose nothing. And so uh, God is glorified thereby because men will perceive even if they don't agree, they'll perceive that the things that God gives are of great price and very precious. I imagine that in the parable, if we'd have heard about how the man treated that pearl of great price, he wouldn't have been walking down the road tossing it up in the air like a ball. He would have been protecting it. So who will lead us in that request that we would learn more fully what it means to lay hold on eternal life? Sister Laura, thank you. Brother Tony, S Sister Annie. Okay, finally, brethren, I'm going to turn back to 1 Timothy. I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 9 and verse 24. And we're asking that all believers would determine to run to obtain the prize. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. It doesn't make any difference at all how many people run or how well they run if you're not one of the ones that come across the line. That everyone has to run their own race. Nobody gets to, to uh, have a proxy step in for them. And so you have to deal yourself with the, um, with the obstacles, uh, with the weariness perhaps, with uh, whatever, depletion, uh, uh, whatever comes your way. Mm -hmm. We already know that the grace of God is sufficient for whatever it is, that he doesn't require of us more than what he gives us the ability to perform or else he make a way of escape for us. So that, that's not even the question. The question is whether we're going to run to obtain the prize. 
whether we're going to stay in the race, whether we're going to keep that prize before us so that, so that we don't wander off of the course, so that we don't flag and decide to stop for a while or get distracted. We don't know when the race is going to be over. See, the finish line isn't the same place for everybody. Everybody's got to get to the finish line, their finish line, and they've got to run their course. It's not even the same course. It's the same type of course. It's the race of faith. But you don't know what you're going to go through to get there any more than I know what I'm going We don't know what the rest of this evening is going to bring forth, much less if the Lord tarries and we have longer periods of time. We, we just don't know. But we do know that until the Lord says, that's the finish line, you've obtained the prize, we have got to continue to run. We, we can't stop, not for a moment. When you lay your head down at night, you're still running the race. When you get up in the morning, you're still running the race. As long as you're drawing breath in these bodies, you are running the race. So that's the, that's the import of, of this request that believers would determine to run to obtain the prize, to not be turned aside. And uh, tonight, as the brethren come forward and, and preach to us, so this is going to sharpen the pe people that are going to comment afterwards, the preaching, the exhortation, Lord's table, the you know our prayers as we pray these things. These are all designed... It, you see people on the side of the course and they're giving water to people that run? Or maybe they've got a team or somebody and they're, they're giving them a power bar or something so that they don't, if it's a long race, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but see, we're strengthening one another in this race of faith. That's why we felt it's important to come together. I mean, there's something to be gained from coming together. And we're learning to keep that prize before us. It's like we're, we're holding out that prize and helping to remind each other. There is a prize. There is. And it's sure to us. All we've got to do is remain faithful and run until we obtain it. So who'll lead us in that request? Sister Nikki. Sister Laura. All right. Thank you very much, brethren. Sister Logan is going to come forward and, and read the sermon text, and Brother Matthew is going to bring our message tonight. And so, uh, Brother Aaron, would you pray for Brother Matt before he comes up? Thank you. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are revealing yourself to us, that you're opening up the 